We present the results on liquid crystal nanocomposite bulk and local structure due to the presence of nanoparticles, and we concentrate on the local structure. This work has been funded through two NSFDMR grants, and the international component has been funded through a Fulbright Specialist Fellowship and an NSF Office of International Programs grant. My collaborators are Professor Lourdes Salamanca Riva from the University of Maryland, Professor Eduardo Soto Bustamante from the University of Chile, and Dr. Lynn Curijara from, or formerly from the Naval Research Labs. We've had graduate students, and I want to especially point out that the work of Jeff Dr. Jefferson Ward Taylor is uh, presented mostly in this talk, and the work from uh, Ariel Meneses Franco, who is in Chile, is, uh, is the one that contributes to the international uh, part of this, uh, of this talk. We've had, in addition, undergraduate students that have, over the years, worked in some aspects of this uh, problem and even started some of the uh, parts of uh, this project. The outline of the talk, I want to, to look at why liquid crystals. Then I will look at what we know that will tell us how the experiment is done. Then I will go into the liquid, uh, into the region close to the nanoparticles and show some of the studies and some of the results that we obtained there. And the expansion to liquid crystals that form polymers, which constitutes our work with the University of Chile. Then I will summarize. First, we will go for why liquid crystals. Liquid crystals have found great application in photovoltaics, mostly because of their ability to self-align. The three references I'm showing uh, now actually use this aspect to uh, improve the transfer, the charge transfer between one material to another. For example, in the first, uh, the first reference, the authors grafted TPS, where TPS a liquid crystal structure to zinc oxide to improve the transfer of charges from P3HT, which is a polymer, to zinc oxide. In the second paper, the authors use the self-aligning properties of viscotic liquid crystals to create a path for holes. In the third paper, the authors grafted 5CB liquid crystals to a non-liquid crystalline polymer to obtain better alignment. So what happens when light shines at the junction of two organic materials or an organic and an inorganic materials? An electron separates from a hole, but they are still tied by Coulomb interactions. In other words, they form an, uh, an exciton. We want to see what happens at the junction between these two materials that allows charges to separate and to pass. To create a current, the exciton must be unbound, and the distance between the electron and the hole must be greater or equal than 10 nanometers. The unbinding has to happen near the boundary of the two materials. This can be achieved through several steps. The first one, you can use the chemical potential because the chemical potential yields a net current flow with little recombinations. And you can use the difference between the electron affinity to help in this, uh, in this aspect. You can also use the high mobility of the liquid crystals, or you can look for for liquid crystals that have a high mobility, because liquid crystals belong to, to a group of organic materials that exhibit the highest mobilities in this uh, type of materials. I will concentrate on the third aspect, which is crystallinity, because crystallinity aids in the charge transport, and the structure provides a path almost free of scattering centers. Our liquid crystal, our modern liquid crystal material is ACB of, or octal cyanobiphenol that we mix with different nanoparticles that will be presented in the next slide. It has two phenol rings that have delocalized electrons. It has two liquid crystalline phases, the nematic phase, where the long axis of the molecule is pointed out at a certain direction, and the smectic phase the smectic A phase, 
that has the long axis of the molecules also pointing out um, in the certain direction. But in addition, it has the uh, molecules lined up in layers. This face has a bookshelf arrangement, and this gives an X-ray signal, which gives us some information about the crystallinity. We have used cobalt iron nanoparticles, where the nanoparticles vary from two nanometers to several micrometers with a very narrow size distribution, as will be seen in the next slide. And we have also used zinc oxide or titanium dioxide particles, which vary between three and six nanometers. We concentrate in the sizes that are closest to the liquid crystal, which for a monomeric liquid crystal, vary between two nanometers and five nanometers. The nanoparticles are generally functionalized with different uh, functionalization compounds or with none at all as the work with uh, the University of Chile uh, will show. We uh, uh, show the results that we obtained with uh, different uh, functionalization such as polyethylene glycol or PEG mercaptohexadecanoic acid, or MHDA, oleic acid, and as I mentioned, none, at the, with the University of Chile. The nanocomposites were prepared as presented in these uh, three lines. The nanoparticles must be isolated by evaporating the glycol or the alcohol uh, where they are and weighed. We then add HCB to the isolated nanoparticles to achieve the desired concentration for the sample that we are preparing. We sonicate the mixture at 50 degrees centigrade for five hours. When the sonication is complete, a small amount of the mixture can be transferred to the substrate for study. Here we present a size distribution by number for um, cobalt iron particles that are covered with MHDA and with polyethylene glycol. You can see that the majority of the particles are at low, um, at low sizes. And uh, in addition, we can see that we always have some clustered particles uh, at, at much higher sizes. But we can only see this if we put this, uh, if we place this graph in logarithmic scale. So now we are ready to look at what we know and how the experiment is done. We know that when we mix liquid crystals with a nanoparticle, where the liquid crystals are designated by the blue ellipsoids, the nanoparticles will line up in columns. These columns help in the charge transfer and also help in the bulk organization of the liquid crystal. This we can uh, determine by varying the the concentration of nanoparticles or nanorods in the liquid crystal and looking at, at the correlation length, which tells us how far inside the material the order of the liquid crystal penetrates. Here we show two results taken from a study in nanorods. And what we have done on the, on, on the right hand side we look at the, at, at the lowest uh, peak, which corresponds to the peak where the liquid crystal is lying flat with the substrate, and look at how the correlation length varies uh, as a function of the weight concentration of zinc oxide. And we find mm -hmm. out that at 35% weight concentration, we will, uh, we will find a maximum. This is also true with a smaller uh, nanorod size, except that with the smaller nanorod size, we can see that there is a difference that is almost uh, an order of magnitude. The uh, red uh, dots actually refer to the variations uh, of these higher, uh, higher, higher order peaks that we will discuss later. If we take the same samples and look at them uh, and look at their electrical properties, we will find out that for both samples, for the 12 times 5 times 5 nanometer cube sample and the 7 times 5 times 5 
nanometer cube samples. The ideal rectifying behavior that we would like to have in a photovoltaic, uh, a med, uh, in a photovoltaic device is obtained for the percentage weight that had the highest correlation length. And uh, this is also true for nanoparticles. For nanoparticles, the highest percentage weight occurs at 30% weight. Now we are ready to look at how the liquid crystal behaves in the, in the vicinity of the nanoparticle. In this article, the authors investigated, theoretically, the interaction between a pneumatic liquid crystal, designated by the uh, black, um, black ellipsoids, the nanoparticle, and the functionalization compounds uh, that surrounded the nanoparticle. The difference between that and our study is that we have asmectic liquid crystals. What we do is we choose the substrate such that it will align the liquid crystals homeotropically or at, uh, at a right angle with respect to the substrate. This gives us an advantage when we do a polarized microscopy study looking from the top down on the liquid crystal because uh, if we only had the liquid crystal aligned homeotropically, that means that only the short axis um, cross section would be facing facing the, um, the the view of the polarized microscopy, and we would not see any birefringence. Therefore, the only birefringence that we would observe would be that caused by the presence of the nanoparticles. If we also choose the X-ray uh, in the X-ray geometry appropriately, we will be able to isolate the nanoparticles. And I show this in the following slide. The, the uh, geometry for the x-rays that we use is the parallel geometry, which is associated better with the grazing incidence um, x-ray scattering. But this is not x-ray incidence scattering. <clears throat> this is just parallel scattering where we are analyzing the entire, uh, the entire sample. So if we uh, bring the x-rays from the side to the sample, if the sample were only constituted by, um, by liquid crystals that, were, that pointed, pointed um, uh, vertically with respect to the substrate, the only thing we would see would be a very wide um, peak that corresponds to the molecule-to-molecule -molecule peak or to the short axis of the molecule uh, peak, and we would not see anything else. If we now add the nanoparticle uh, or nanoparticles to, um, uh, to this, uh, to, to this uh, 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 situation, then we would observe what we would think would be an average of the of the orientations that the bulk liquid crystal would adopt, and again we would observe the um, the molecule to molecule interaction, and this molecule to molecule interaction can then be subtracted together with the background. Now that we have shown the two uh, the two principal ways that we are going to study the material. We will show some of the studies that we did in the region close to the nanoparticles. The first thing is that the polarizing microscope results, in addition to give us results that, that give us some information about the nanoparticles, give us a clue as to why we obtained the X-ray signal. I show the results both for the aminopropyl thiotoxysilane 30% weight, and remember I mentioned that the 30% weight is the um, is the weight at where where the um, where the the liquid crystal and nanoparticle nanocomposite is better organized, and the mercaptohexadecanoic acid thirty percent weight. I show the APDS even though we did not do detailed studies on the APDS this time because we have taken it at uh, lower magnification, so uh, they will show they show um, they show better the structure. Uh, that the uh, nanoparticles, um, that the nanoparticles uh, uh, obtain in the um, when you studied 
them with a polarizing microscope. You can see that the nanoparticles are, uh, are organized in what we might call a hexatic fashion. So it is not a hexagonal fashion because it's not uh, completely organized. But if you can see also these, uh, these defects, uh, which are known as uh, ring defects or Saturn ring def defects, are very well organized. So in that way, they will present an ordered, uh, an ordered uh, uh, the structure for the X-rays to analyze. So what we learn from the polarizing microscope is that the nanoparticles align, and so the, do the defects that they produce. Now we present results of the cobalt iron nanoparticles covered with MHDA and with PEG, with polyethylene glycol. These two were taken as a function of uh, temperature, where the upper temperatures are in the smectic phase of the, of the material. The middle temperatures happen where the smectic is, uh, is, is going into the nematic phase, and the lower ones are in the nematic phase. So there are several things that we can say about the uh, about these uh, um, uh, scans, which I present in the next in, in the next uh, um, slide. The signal is noisier for the mercaptohexadecanoic acid because it's a smaller functionalization compound compared to the PEC compound. The signal consists of three or four peaks. Where in the PEC we have the peak at 0.2 um, angstroms, inverse angstroms in Q absent. So in other words, the peak is quantized. Each signal is fitted to a Gaussian. And the signal does not change significantly as a function of temperature as one goes from the smectic to the nematic, uh, to the nematic phase. So we are going to look at each of those aspects separately. The first one, we want to look at uh, what happens that we have a quantized peak instead of the average peak that we were expecting, or that should be expected when you have a, uh, a spherical nanoparticle. If we look at the higher uh, order peaks, or, or the higher Q peaks, and compare the angles that those peaks uh, that, 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 that those peaks uh, form with the lower order peak or the peak at uh, at 0.2 inverse angstroms, we find out that the angles between the higher Q peaks and the peak at 0.2 inverse angstroms corresponds to the angle between the different facets of a cubic or tetragonal structure. So we present here the cubic and tetragonal structure. And uh, we present the way that the liquid crystals will align along that facet. So instead of averaging over, over the, um, uh, the uh, spherical uh, sample, they will organize according to the, uh, to the facets where, uh, where, um, that the uh, nanoparticle shows. According to these two uh, articles that I show here in the in the um, that I show here, the nanoparticles uh, could be faceted, but you would always find that there were some uh, spherical nanoparticles. So when we originally did this work, we thought that it was just the nanoparticles working in this uh, to create this uh, this uh, quantized peak. But now I'm more convinced that the possible explanation might be found out in these two papers where they look at the functionalizations and the functionalizations will have intermolecular pi phi interactions along the equator of the, uh, of, of the spherical nanoparticles while they will have intramolecular pi phi interactions along the poles. This will actually lead to their groupings into macrocubes or macro tetragons, which I show here in the reflection in one in, in two dimensions. Uh, we are planning to perform SACS uh, experiments to investigate whether or not we get this macro structure. 
From the Gaussian fitting, we can obtain the correlation length of how far this organization penetrates into the sample. And we have here the results for both myocaptohexadecanoic acid and polyethylene glycol. You, you see that the organization goes from being one, one to two molecular lengths for both phosphodializations. This means that it is short ranged. So what can we conclude from the phase transition? We can fit all peaks to the Gaussian even in dynamatic, and that means that the liquid crystal next to the nanoparticle has symmetric behavior, even though it is quite disordered. We can observe the faceting even when we go into the pneumatic. The correlation length remains almost constant through the symmetric a pneumatic transition. The liquid crystal remains attached to the nanoparticle or groups of nanoparticles, and so do the nanoparticles. The correlation length is one to two molecular lengths, as I showed in the previous slide, and as I mentioned, it goes on into the pneumatic phase. Uh, it is short range even in the smectic A phase and remains constant into the pneumatic phase. Now that we showed some of our results in our model system, we want to go to the expansion to the liquid crystal that form polymers. Oh, this is our work with Chile. What the group in Chile has done is that they have, they have uh, made some titanium dioxide nanoparticle that um, vary in sizes between three and six nanometer in size. And uh, they prepare it such that they, uh, they don't have any functionalization compound, but they're surrounded by OH groups um, all through the nanoparticle. In addition, they have uh, synthesized two liquid crystals that are fairly similar, except that uh, this first liquid crystal, which is known as M, uh, for the um, for the group uh, the group that uh, that that is the final group in the in, in the long carbon chain, will eventually polymerize. We have not looked at the polymerized sample, not just yet. Um, the uh, group the final group in the carbon in the carbon chain uh, can form a hydrogen bond with the titanium uh, titanium dioxide. And the first uh, measurement in these samples actually show that uh, the the three um, the three uh, peaks that we also observed in our model system that seem to uh, indicate that somehow the titanium dioxide and these, uh, these attached um, M samples will uh, also form a cubic or tetragonal um, uh, uh, structure. They also observe a compound that they call I, which is distinguished from the other one in the, in, in the sense that it does not polymerize and it does not have a group uh, at the end of the carbon chain that will go into a uh, hydrogen bond with uh, the titanium dioxide. So instead, the group for uh, the group that goes into an uh, into a, um, a hydrogen bond with a titanium dioxide is the acyl group. And again, for this sample. We also observe the three peaks that may be associated with either the macrocube or the macro tetragon. If we look at these, uh, at these uh, two samples in the um, concentration of, uh, of titanium dioxide, that, that gives us the most uh, ordered um, sample, which again is 30% weight, uh, we observe that the two samples will have a smectic C at a smectic A sample, and the smectic A will go into the anisotropic sample. When they crystallize, uh, the M sample will, will go with the molecules in the smectic C configuration, whereas the M, uh, the I sample will go into the smectic A configuration. Therefore, thermodynamically, 
the I sample is more disordered than the M sample. However, the current versus temperature for the M mixtures is much smaller than for the I mixture. The current versus temperature for these samples shows that in addition to having the sample ordered, it must be ordered such that the delocalized electrons face the nanoparticles. As you can see from the previous slide, the I has the, the localized electrons facing the nanoparticles. So based on these, uh, on these results, we can now make a simple model for uh, what happens at the junction between the nanoparticle and the liquid crystal. The liquid crystals in the vicinity of the nanoparticles which are denoted by the blue ellipsoids in this drawing, form the junction of a diode. If the molecules in the bulk that are denoted by the red ellipsoids are not aligned with the molecules in the vicinity of the nanoparticle, the electrons get scattered and the charges do not reach the junction. The sample behaves very much like a resistor. If the molecules in the bulk of the liquid crystals align with the molecules in the vicinity of the nanoparticle, we will get rectifying behavior. And in addition, molecules need to have their delocalized electrons facing the nanoparticles in the direction of conduction for maximum current. So in, summaries, in summary, we have found that the liquid crystal structure at the surface of the nanoparticle is that of a disordered vectic. The structure follows the faceting of the nanoparticles or the groups of nanoparticles, we are beginning to understand how this disordered region works together with the bulk region to allow for charge transfer. And now we can answer some of the uh, some of the questions that we had let uh, uh, that we had uh, said that we would answer at the end of the talk. We have observed for the for for the nanorods. Um, higher order or higher Q peaks, and we have also observed it for the nano uh, for the nanoparticles. And these higher Q peaks did not show any variation in their uh, in their correlation length. We think that these higher Q peaks are are the Q peaks that are that are uh, that are due to the micro Q. So we have observed it even from before. And uh, uh, the fact that we actually observed what seems to be a rectifying curve that is, uh, that is more or less equal in the positive and the negative side can be explained by our model um, in, in this way. When we, have, when we are on, in the positive side, we will have one side that is forward biased. When we go to the negative side, the other side will be forward biased, and we will get the uh, negative the, the negative results um, that are almost equal to the positive results except on the negative side. 